I have just three points, if I may. Uh, I believe I was brought in from the Annette Strauss Institute for Civic Life to talk a bit about voting and how we talk about voting. And um, in 2018, I published a book that had three parts. One was an analysis of how journalists have reported on voting from 1948 to 2016. The second part was uh, a set of experiments on how everyday uh, people reacted to these narratives. And then the third part was interviews with 54 elite journalists on how they reacted to how the experiments went. And the bottom line from that book was, we simply don't realize how we leave voters out of the narrative. And it's great to see Jen, it's great to see so many people on these calls. Um, uh, we, we don't realize how much power when we talk about voting, we give to pundits, we give to pollsters, we give to outside entities, and we don't think about how voters are the ones who really make the decisions. So that book led to a grant from the Democracy Fund, which I'd love to plug. And if you're okay, Justin, I might try to share a screen if I may. This is from the Electorally Speaking Project. And Justin, if you can give me a thumbs up if you see that on your screen. Perfect. So what we did in this project is we worked with journalists, and I don't know how many journalists we have on the call, but we worked with advocates as well. And we have really profound data showing that very well-intentioned tweets, like the one on the left here, uh, if your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't be trying so hard to keep you from voting, versus, which is just the threat tweet versus the one on the right. Uh, if you're turned away at the polls because your name is not on the registrar, don't walk away, request a ballot. Um, and this again was in the 2018 election cycle, but we have data coming in also going into the 2020 election cycle that um, the way that we talk about elections really matters. We don't realize the extent to which the nouns and the verbs that we use when we talk about voting really extends to voters. Um, but for all of you who are doing the, the very important work of trying to address threats to elections, when we address the threat and we also mention the solution, uh, our research over the past three years shows that it really, really matters. But the one study that I'm presenting comes from a four-wave panel survey, which means we had four uh, ways of contacting the same 3,000 people going into the 2018 elections. They had to respond to the first wave to be invited to the next four. Uh, first wave, we just got demographics. Second wave, we had our first experiment, which was how journalists uh, address elections. The third wave was um, our second experiment on Twitter. And uh, that's what I just shared when I gave that example there. And then the fourth wave was a bunch of open-ended items after the end of the 2018 election. So um, I, I have tremendous uh, I, gratitude for the Democracy Fund, they paid for it. Um, but, but I do believe we, we, we learned a lot there in that um, when we do address the threat and the solution, that gets us closer to uh, both men and women, both Democrats and Republicans, both younger people and older people, all believing that their vote matters. Tom Patterson is a scholar from uh, Harvard. He's a political scientist, and he's posted a set of stories or a, a set of content analyses of how much attention we give to particular speakers. And, and my point is, you know, just because they're out there saying something, it doesn't necessarily mean they need attention. And uh, journalists will say this time and time again, and when I interview them, they'll say, perhaps I shouldn't have given that uh, politician more time. But an earnest response, response to that question is just because a politician is speaking doesn't necessarily mean they, they deserve our time.